Now, if you ever want an unsolved, totally baffling scientific mystery, then the Tunguska event is top of the pops. Science has no answers. Research, expeditions and actual hard evidence have all drawn a blank. But let's have a look for ourselves and see if we can bring anything to the forefront, anything that may shine a light on this mysterious event. It's early morning, around 7am, on the 30th of June, 1908. The quietness is about to be shattered in a remote area of Siberia. This part of unforgiving wilderness is home to few. Only a handful of indigenous natives made up of clans brave the harsh elements to live here. It's a pleasant morning with little wind as the harsh winter is fading quickly. A man from the Avenki tribe sits untroubled on the porch of his small self-made home. Suddenly, without warning, the ground begins to shake violently, almost knocking him to the ground. A loud roar forces him to cover his ears. As he looks up in bewilderment, a massive ball of fire streaks through the cloudless sky, heading towards the horizon. The land he is looking out into is full of pine trees and larches and birch as far as the eye can see. The tall trees sway uncontrollably as the fireball rushes past. The man watches in amazement for several minutes as the shaking and the roar slowly fades. Then just as suddenly, the ball of fire in the distance explodes into a gigantic fireball. This time the man is knocked to his feet and the glass in the windows of his modest home shatters, spraying shards around him. He picks himself up only to be knocked to the floor once more as a massive warm shockwave rips through the area. Eventually, it all calms and the confused clansman stares at the distant mushroom cloud of fire. The first thing he notices is that three to four hundred yards away, all of the once healthy trees had been felled, all in the same direction towards his home. The shockwave was that intense. He immediately feels lucky to be alive. His family, stepping over glass, come out and join him on the porch. They all look at each other, perplexed as to what had just happened. That's just as perplexed as the true scientists of today feel. See, as of today, only theories explain what happened that morning. There is no definitive proof. And they even admit that to themselves. This explosion, this unexplained event, wiped out, and get this, approximately 83 million trees and demolished an area of 850 square miles of dense forest, swampland and unforgiving tundra. This area of Siberia is so remote, it took another 20 odd years before any expedition had the equipment and know-how, let alone the courage, to investigate what had happened. In 1928, a mineralogist from the Soviet Union, Leonid Kulik, arranged an expedition to investigate this event. 20 long years had passed, and he was well aware and under no illusion that a lot of crucial evidence had been lost forever, but remained hopeful that they could find things that could answer questions. Kulik had attempted the same trip seven years previous in 1921, but failed early on into the journey because of the harsh terrain. Kulik and his team set out on the new arduous journey, reaching the Siberian forest by boat before a long hike to the epicenter. Once reaching the area affected by the 1908 event, he and his team began interviewing eyewitnesses. It was obvious from the start that the event had hit hard on the local indigenous clans that were furthest away from the epicenter, and those who had survived spoke mostly of a visitation from Ogdi, a thunder god who grew angry and cursed the area by smashing down trees and killing animals. They spoke of a bluish light that soared high up in the sky that was as bright as the sun. Despite scientists and historians stating that only three people died, it was more apparent that several whole tribes had been lost. Believe it or not, historians still state only three deaths to this day because of lack of evidence. Kulik and the team moved closer to Ground Zero. It was a struggle, but they eventually made it. The whole team quickly came to the assumption that a large meteor had caused the devastation. 
so they set out to find the crater. No obvious crater was evident. The next decision was to drain some of the lakes to see if the lake bed was the impact crater. After busy days of draining, they became confused. At the bottom of each lake, they found both old and fresh tree roots were growing, thus ending the assumption that these were the craters. After more searching, they came across trees that had been ripped from their roots and turned upside down. Others still wore charcoal scar marks to one side of their trunk. All of those trees were lying flat on the floor, all facing the same way, until they spotted further in a group of trees that had their entire branches stripped but were remained upright. All around the trees, others laid burnt and lifeless. These flattened trees acted as markers, pointing directly away from the blast epicenter. Being a mineralogist, Kulik's main goal before leaving was to find evidence of a meteorite. He found no evidence of this. The soil hadn't been contaminated, and vital signs of meteor minerals were non-existent. Kulik would go on to make three visits in total to this strange Siberian wasteland with similar results each time. One time he did manage to get excellent testimony from a local who lived in Vanavara, the nearest village to the blast. It was a former fur trading post at the time of the event and this man witnessed it all. This eyewitness mentioned that the sky had somehow split in two and above this the sky appeared to be on fire. He said all at the trading post heard a mighty crash, followed by what sounded like lots of stones falling, or as one man put it, rapid gunfire. This enhanced Kulik's theory, although not coupled with physical evidence of a massive meteorite causing the blast and all its devastation. World War II hit and Kulik was drafted into the Soviet army. In 1941, he ended up as a German prisoner of war and was unable to visit Tunguska again. Kulik's theory of a meteorite or an asteroid holds stern to historians and scientists to this day. But there are other theories that could hold true. When the Americans dropped nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki near the end of World War II, the havoc and destruction these two bombs caused showed some important clues at what a large blast above ground could achieve. The loss of life was horrendous beyond belief. As cruel as it seems, Tunguska researchers used what was left as a yardstick to what happened in 1908. They noticed that in the vicinity of Ground Zero at Hiroshima, the area below where the explosion had taken place, numerous trees were still standing. Just like in Tunguska, they had been stripped totally of bark and branches, but were still standing upright, not flattened like you would imagine. They say that the Tunguska explosion was 1,000 times greater than Hiroshima. Blimey. So is that proof that whatever exploded in Siberia did so from above, a meteorite or an asteroid? Most categorically think so. Back in 1908, the explosion was so great it was recorded by seismographs in London, Denmark and other more eastern cities. Plus, the theory of a meteorite is more likely because of the size of the area devastated. 850 square miles of felled trees isn't small. It's about the same size as Greater London, or over two and a half times the size of Dallas in Texas. That's big. Other scientists put forward that it was a collision of two comets, and not a meteorite or an asteroid at all. The fact of the matter is, although we can only give our best guess, whether you're a scientist or a normal layperson, it is, in fact, just a guess. Of course, there are other theories to add. There is a professor and a former curator of a Tunguska event museum in Germany that thinks it was a massive gas blast from a subterranean volcano. He believes that volcanic funnels beneath the earth under our very feet can erupt at any time, causing a colossal gas storm forced out by overpressurized gases. He has compared the Tunguska event with other volcanic events that have happened all around the world. He believes they all show the same picture just some are bigger or smaller than others. This could be true because of the eyewitness accounts from the clansmen of the earth rumbling before the explosion and the fact that the explosion, according to some more testimonies, lasted an hour and sounded like gunfire. Plus a huge dust cloud after the event did reach as far as London. 
even allowing Londoners to read newspapers at midnight because of the gas clouds still being so bright. This lasted for three days and I backed up with confirmation. As with a lot of strange places or occurrences or incidents that happen in this wonderful world of ours, aliens aren't far from the lips of some theorists. Some believe that a huge alien spacecraft that had been buried for centuries, hiding in the remoteness of Siberia, took off and collided with an asteroid that was about to hit Earth, obliterating all that lives on it. So the aliens saved us, so they think. Thank God for that. What do you think? Should we rule that one out? Some think a time travel vortex opened up in the skies above the Siberian wilderness and a nuclear bomb from the 1970s travelled through and detonated in 1908. Or on the same theme, others think it was a Soviet weapons test gone horribly wrong, ending up in the Siberian wastelands. One of the most bizarre theories is that a humongous swarm of mosquitoes flew over the region and because of the winter temperatures, which can reach minus 40 degrees by the way, were on the change to the summer temperatures, which can reach plus 35 degrees by the way, and all the mosquitoes exploded, causing a massive eruption that has never been seen since. No idea why. And yes, this was an actual theory put forward. But putting all the bizarre theories aside, the meteor or asteroid theory does sound the most plausible. My only gripe with this though, or several gripes if I'm honest, is how scientists blog their stories. Let me ask. Now, they have stated that the meteor weighed 12 megatons. How do they know this? They say it was travelling at 33,000 miles per hour. There's that number, 33 again. How do they know that? And they say that it exploded between 10 to 15 kilometres above the Earth. Were they there? Did they see it? So how do they come to these conclusions, and so precise? That's why their conclusions put me off a tad. Why don't they just say they don't know? Or is that not in their street cred lexicon? Plus, they say it didn't land, yet local eyewitnesses say it did. So where's the crater? They say it happened in an area so remote. That remote that there's a fur trading post there. They say only three died, but the natives to the area say many clans were wiped out. Nothing ever adds up when they throw in their scientific two penner. There have been several more expeditions since Kulik's journey. The first outside the Soviet Union was an Italian expedition in 1991. They took soil samples from all over the area, including from Lake Cecco, where they were convinced the crater was made. Once again, though, the soil samples showed no evidence of a meteorite, none of the minerals that a meteorite is made of. Later, in the year 2000, a German scientist researched the area with his crew. They thought they would study a large stone that had been discovered in the area around 1972. It's called the John Stone. It's a stone that sits out of place. The rocks around Tunguska are basalt. This stone, the John Stone, is crystallised quartz. But once again, this stone was proven not to be of extraterrestrial origins. It wasn't from outer space like a meteor would be. It was of Earth origins. Nowadays, expeditions or visits to the Tunguska region are more accessible. The Churim waterfall has become quite an attraction. One person's visit to a place called Idol Mountain caused quite a stir. They noticed that whilst on Idol Mountain, a relatively low height mountain in the Tunguska area, they noticed all quartz watches stopped. The common digital watch worked as normal, but any watch with quartz in its mechanism stopped. Are we back on the magnetic earth again? Its magnetic field yet again? Does this have anything to do with the Tunguska event? Also, it was noted that when up on this mountain, and don't forget this isn't very high, people would become very irritable, almost aggressive, and some even collapsed momentarily. They know that this mountain was within the Tunguska event zone because some of the tree stumps were still burnt on one side. What is happening up on Idol Mountain? Does it really bear significance to what happened back in 1908? There is also another mountain in the area, Mount Farrington. It's a little higher than Idol Mountain, but nonetheless still quite low as mountains go. Compasses show opposite readings up there. For example, it will show south for north and east for west. 
bizarre. No one knows why, it just happens. What's going on in this area? What's being found out now that folk can get to parts of it? Now that the area is recovering, the foliage is regrowing and other bizarre anomalies are being uncovered. In the new recovered soil, plants and trees grow at a much quicker rate than anywhere else in Siberia. They know this through the tree rings. The rings were tightly grouped up until after the Tunguska event when the rings have become evidently wider, a lot wider. Standard pine needles tend to grow in clusters of odd numbers, at least they do in forests all over the world. Here, in Tunguska, they now grow in clusters of even numbers. Something has changed, but what? NASA has started to get involved in this event. As per norm, they are using the Tunguska event as a scare tactic against us. According to them, another three asteroids, similar if not bigger than the Tunguska event, are on their way to us. Asteroid 2020SB, Asteroid 524522 and Meteor 2020CR1. They are getting dangerously close, allegedly, and in their words, not mine, all three are city killers, just like the other 150 they've pushed for decades now, so don't get too alarmed. Wait till asteroid T-O-T-A-L, B-S, lands. It'll be them in trouble, not us. There is no doubt Tunguska is a beautiful, remote, yet unforgiving region. There is also no doubt that something happened in 1908, and no one knows what. Was it an alien spacecraft saving us from total annihilation? Did loads of pesky mosquitoes explode because they were just far too full? Will the new Russia admit that the old Soviet Union back then got an atomic bomb test all wrong? Did a Tesla-style energy weapon go astray? Was it the result of a huge subterranean volcano? Or is the most common theory correct? And a large meteor detonated way up in the Siberian skies, causing a colossal explosion, wiping out 83 million trees. Wow, some carbon footprint there. You be the judge. Thanks for watching again. Hope you enjoyed it. It's got to be some kind of meteor or something like that, don't you think? Don't forget to leave a comment and tell me what you think happened. I promise to reply. Well, that's the end of the Exploring Earth Secrets series. It was quite successful, so I may visit some more in the future. The next series is all about crimes, and I've found some really strange and bizarre cases to ponder, from a juror being the actual killer to an alleged suicide victim phoning the judge. I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope you like it too. Anyhow, I wonder if NATO asked Putin to set this carbon footprint after that event as reparation, perhaps. Nothing would surprise me nowadays. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye for now.